offered to recite the text, but it's not hardly worth her coming all the way up here for one verse, so I'll just go ahead and read it. But uh, invite, it's an important text, important verse, and it's significant to us. So I want you to listen carefully to this, and let us think, uh, let's think uh, seriously and prayerfully about the implications of this text in our lives. Ephesians 4.28 says, Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so a couple months ago, and back in September, uh, Kit and Haley and I went to this conference called Jobs for Life. And it was really good. It was a two-day conference. Uh, we learned a lot about how to help people get better prepared so they are equipped to get jobs. And there's all kinds of stuff you might expect. You know, um, it's an eight-week, it's, it's designed to be an eight-week course where there's 16 lessons, and they teach things like uh, resume writing and good interview skills and how to network with people in the area that maybe they're in a position to find jobs for you or provide jobs for a person. Um, a lot of it is just relational, just encouraging. You pray for people. Uh, you develop uh, a network of people to, to kind of help look out for each other and, and uh, encourage each other, uh, really creating a positive attitude and, and, and just giving people hope. And so in a, in a number of different ways, I thought it was really, I think going through this sem seminar helped us have a better appreciation for how people struggle financially sometimes and, and how to help maybe help them meet their needs or help them help themselves to meet their needs and uh, how we can help each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And early on in the conference, um, they had a different, several different pr people presenting. They had PowerPoint presentations. And early on in the conference, uh, one of the ladies showed a picture of, uh, of a woman that she knows that went through this ministry. And I wanted to share a picture of her with you all, but unfortunately there wasn't a copy of her picture on the website or anything. It, it is in the study guide, so there she is. That's what she looks like. And um, if you want to... Can't really see that very well. I'll just describe the picture to you. I'll describe what this woman looks like. And I want you to imagine it in your, in your mind, okay? And so uh, this is an African American woman. She's probably mid middle aged woman. Um, she has very matted hair. And on the above her right temple, it's kind of all sticking out this way, kind of tough sticking out that way. And above her left ear, it's kind of sticking back this way. And her eyebrows are kind of flat and kind of sloping downward towards each other a little bit in the middle. Um, she has very heavy, drooping eyelids, and her eyes are kind of dull and lifeless looking. Um, her, she has very dark circles around both eyes, very large dark circles around both eyes, and her mouth is kind of turned downward, kind of a solemn expression on her face. And um, her head is tilted, it kind of has a, a defeated look about her. She looks like someone who's just been beaten down in life. And I actually think this is actually a, um, um, <clears throat> what do you call a picture you take in when you are arrested? A mugshot. I think this is actually, actually a mugshot of, of this woman. And if I got it right, I think she was arrested for prostitution and for theft. And so as we looked at this picture up on the screen, we're asked to write some words of what the impression this woman made on us, write some descriptive words of her. And so maybe as I was sharing this description of her, maybe you had words in your mind about what would, how you would describe this woman, how, what you might think of her, the impression she might made of you, made upon you. And um, we're also asked to just guess what her name might be. And so different people throw out different names. She looks like so-and-so and so-and-so. She might be called this, she might be called that. I, I didn't actually verbalize my name. I just kind of kept it to myself. But I thought to myself, this, I think maybe she might be called a certain name. And so I'd ask you then also to imagine, what do you think this woman's name might be? What do you think she might be called? Well, whatever her name is, um, Paul is writing to her in this text. And Paul is writing to untold numbers of other people who are struggling much as she is. You know, she, I mentioned she's struggling. She got arrested for prostitution and for theft, and she has serious financial needs. So a lot of people don't commit crimes and they have financial needs. They're honest, hardworking people, but they're down on their luck, so to speak. Maybe they're going through a uh, medical hardship and they have mounting medical bills, or maybe they lost their job and they can't find a new one, or maybe they don't have current job skills, or maybe they're going through a divorce or they were abandoned, or 
They, they grew up homeless. Their, their parents couldn't take care of them, and they just have, they're part of this generational poverty. There could be a thousand different reasons why people are struggling financially. But um, so many people find themselves in these circumstances. And this woman in particular, um, she resorted to stealing. She resorted to, to selling her body. And, and, and Paul um, speaks to her and, and to so many other people in this text by saying that thieves must give up stealing. And so I, I wanted you to picture, maybe, maybe this woman tried to pick your pocket and you, you caught her. And, and how would you respond? How would you react to that? And I, honestly, if someone tried to pick my pocket, regardless of who it was, I'd be mad at them. I mean, that's my initial response would be, would be angry. And I'd be, probably be quick to condemn her with God's word. You know, thou shall not steal. And probably, if I didn't actually say it, it'd, it'd definitely be in my heart. It'd be in my mind. You're not supposed to do that. That's wrong. It's bad to steal. And, you know, some people steal um, for the thrill of it. Some people steal because they don't care about other people. They just want to get more stuff for themselves. But it's important for us to realize that, that many people, when they steal, they steal because they're trying to scrape by. They, they steal out of a sense of desperation. And, and maybe if we had the opportunity to know this woman, we might feel compassion for her. We might recognize that that act of stealing is a red flag that's a, it's showing us that this person has a serious need and it's not being met. And I'm, I'm certainly not saying it's okay to steal. It's not, you know. Stealing is both a sin and a crime. And there should be consequences for it. But we should not allow our anger to blind us to the truth that God wants us to love this woman, even if she's a thief. Maybe especially if she's a thief. Read the Gospels. You know, Jesus was a friend of who? Tax collectors and sinners, right? What were tax collectors? They were basically professional thieves, right? They were gouging the people. And it's hard for us to appreciate really what Jesus did unless we get in a situation like this where someone is trying to take from us. And then we, we realize the challenge that it is to love someone who's treated us badly, who's trying to get away with something. But God would be pleased with us if we made the effort to know this person, to understand what she's going through, and then to love her and try to help her through it. Now, we learned at the Jobs for Life seminar that this woman actually grew up in a very rough environment. Um, she grew up in a home with her mom and her mom's boyfriend. And her mom's boyfriend abused her and took his pleasure in her, for her at her harm. He was, she was treated very badly. And she didn't grow up learning job skills. She didn't, she didn't grow up learning um, how to have good social skills. She, she just grew up trying to survive, and she was basically taught through the experiences she had that she was worthless and she was an object to be used. And now as an adult, she doesn't have a, a good network of people to support her, to help her. She doesn't have a family members that she can look to for, for help or guidance or, or provision. She doesn't have the know-how to find a good job, and she lacks the confidence that she needs to improve herself. But she needed to pay her bills. She didn't have honest work. And so she resorted to taking what belongs to others and allowing others to take her dignity from her. And that doesn't excuse stealing. It doesn't excuse selling her body, but it maybe does help to explain it a little bit. And as followers of Christ, we're called to help her do what Paul commands in God's word. Paul, after Paul says thieves must give up stealing, he then adds, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands. And so instead of taking from others, God wants her to make her own money so she can pay her own bills. And God wants her to get a good job, not just for the sake of paying her bills, but because there's so many other ways in which we're blessed through, through the gift of work. And so we're called to help her, to, to help her be prepared and to get the skills and the, and the, and the foundation she needs to become self-sustaining. You know, the work is an essential part of our experience to have an abundant life in Christ. is an essential part of us expressing, reflecting God's image in the world. And it's very clear to us, if we go back all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, um, it says in 2.15 that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And what we see from this short verse is that when God created this paradise called Eden, he put Adam and Eve in this paradise, right? And before sin, 
before anything bad was in the world, while everything was paradise, everything was perfect and beautiful and wonderful, in that setting, God commanded Adam to work. And presumably Eve was working too. Of course she was working. Adam was tilling the ground, and we'll see later that Eve was taking care of their children and whatever else they need to do to enjoy life in the garden. But they're working. And they're working in a place that is paradise. And that shows us that God's intention for work is that it brings us pleasure. It, it brings us satisfaction. It, 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 gives us, it gives us purpose. And that work is a gift from God. And even after the fall, even after um, sin enters the, the picture, um, we see that Adam then has to till the soil by the sweat of his brow, that work becomes hard, it becomes frustrating. Even then... Um, there's still a sense in which it's a gift from God. It's still, it's still a blessing for us. God made Adam and Eve in his own image, right? And one of the primary ways we understand God is as creator. He made the heavens and the earth. And so the way, one of the ways we reflect God's image is by being productive and by exercising our creativity to do um, productive things, to exercise our creativity through the discipline of work. And so if we help this woman get work, um, she's going to be blessed, not only with being able to provide for herself and her family, uh, but also she's reflecting God's image. Um, work, work gives her an identity. You know, we, we, we closely associate who we are with what we do, don't we? When, when you have a conversation with someone, you're first getting to know them, um, one of the first things we usually say to someone is, so what do you do? Or we feel compelled to tell them, this is what I do, I'm a pastor, what, 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 what's your job? People come to Cornerstone and, and they visit for the first time and I tend to ask the same questions over and over again. So, how do you hear about Cornerstone? We're so glad that you're here. Do you know anyone that, you know here anyone here? Do you, know, you know, have any relationships with anyone here at Cornerstone? Um, how long have you been in Goldsboro? How long have you been in Wayne County? And eventually, you, all, you almost always get around to, and also, oh, what do you do? And people will say, well, I'm a pilot, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a nurse, or I'm a, I'm a carpenter. Or, um, could be, I'm a landscaper. Could be a number of things. I'm a stay-at-home mom. But... That, that, that occupation that we have is closely associated with our identity. And when this woman gets a meaningful job, a meaningful place of employment, that is a great um, addition to her identity. It's, it allows her to, to say, this is, in a way, this is who I am. And along with that, work gives us dignity. It, it gives us a sense of self-respect. It says, I have the capacity to provide for myself or even my family. It says, um, I'm making a meaningful contribution to society. It says, I'm significant. And so when this woman has work, it restores some of the dignity that she lost through the experiences she had in her childhood. And, and of course, work can be very fulfilling. You know, we, we enjoy work when it, we're productive, when we do something we are good at, when we can use our skills. It's, 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 uh, it's very satisfying to say, I made that. I did that. I was part of that project. That got done because I was part of this team, and we worked on this together. That feels good. God made us that way, to, to be creative and to, to be uh, um, productive and um, to use those skills he's entrusted to us. It's very fulfilling. And, and all that brings God's glory because, as I said, he's the creator, and we reflect his image in the world when we are creative and productive with the gifts that he's given us. And then, and then finally, work is empowering. When we work, we experience the power of influencing our community, and we experience the power of, of, of providing for our families. Um, we, ha we receive income that we can use to, to exercise freedom and to do things we want to do and to have the things we hope to have. Uh, work is very empowering for us. And so God doesn't want this woman to take from others anymore. Instead, he wants her to start making an income to provide for her and her family. She can pay her bills. But we see more than that. Um, God also wants us um, to use what we have, to use the gifts we've been entrusted with, to partake in the life of others. He wants us to move from taking, if we've ever been there, hopefully we've not been there at all, to making, to partaking in the lives of others. God wants us to be, um, to, to, to more fully realize how much we need each other and how we can participate in life together. And that's why Paul ends this verse by saying, have something to share with the needy. Okay? And our immediate response to that might be, well, he just wants us to give people some food. He wants to give us, 
give, give them a little money to help them with something. And that might be part of it. But that's not the main thrust of what Paul's talking about. That's not the main thrust of, of, of God's hopes for us. Um, God wants one, those of us who work to use some of our excess funds that to help people who are struggling with their needs. He wants us to help people like the woman in that picture that I've described to you. Um, if she has an immediate need of food and clothing and, and shelter, then we should help them. And a, and a person who has those needs shouldn't feel ashamed that they need help. We, we all need help in one way or another. We all are recipients of God's grace. And God has designed us to be dependent upon each other as, as human beings and as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when someone has a genuine need, we should seek to meet that need. Um, but God wants us to do more than just hand someone a little money or hand, hand someone some groceries. He wants us to be in meaningful relationship with each other. And I want to share a little story that kind of illustrates that. Um, about a year ago, uh, after worship, some guy shows up at the back door, and I think Dwight ran to Dwight, and Dwight came and got me, and I went and saw him. And he's got this hat down low on his face, and he's wearing these big sunglasses, and he says, Pastor, I need some help. And I said, well, come on in. He walked down the hall, went over to the office, and he kept his sunglasses on, which made me wonder what's going on here. He doesn't want me to see his eyes. He's, you know, is, are they bloodshot? Has he been on drugs? Is he lying to me? It just made me feel a little suspicious, guy is still wearing his sunglasses in the building. But he goes on to say, well, um, something really bad has happened. You know, my, my son got in this horrible car accident. He was hit by a drunk driver. He was in an IC, the ICU up in a hospital up in Baltimore. And I'm a little bit skeptical of this guy's uh, his story. But, you know, I mean, you don't want to be wrong if he's, if he's in this situation. You can't turn someone away. You've got to show people the love of Christ on some level. So I said, okay, well, let, I made a photocopy of his driver's license. And I gave him 20 bucks, give him a little gas money, help him a little bit at least to get up towards Baltimore. And then we prayed together. I prayed that his son would be well and he'd be able to see him. And he thanked me and then he left. <clears throat> and I never heard from him after that. Never got any report about how his son was doing or nothing. And after a while, I just kind of forgot about it. Well, about two months ago, um, I'm kind of polishing up my sermon on Saturday night. I'm in my office and this car Pulls, a van pulls up under the carport over here, and I go out the door to meet this person, and the guy hops out, and it's, it's at night, it's late at night, and he says, I'm not going to hurt you. And I said, good. And then he said, I, Pastor, I need some help. He said, um, my son got in a horrible car accident, and um, he got hit by a drunk driver. He's, down, he's in the ICU down in a hospital down in Wilmington. And he says, you look at my tires. My tires are all worn out. I'm afraid I can't drive in these tires go all the way down to Wilmington. This guy looked familiar to me. And um, I said, wait a minute. I went to my office, got my photocopy of the driver's license. Sure enough, it's Danny. Go back. Not that Danny. Little Danny. Go out to the front door. I said, Danny, you were here 10 months ago. And you told me that was the exact same story. And he pauses and he says, yeah, it's happened to me twice. And I just take a deep breath, and I go, um, Danny, I'm sorry for what you're going through, but I'm not going to give you any money tonight. And he just got in his van, and he left. And, you know, I don't know if what Danny was doing was technically stealing. I mean, in the eyes of the law, I don't know if that's theft. He was conning me. Um, but I think in the eyes of God, that would be considered theft. But he was, he was a thief. And... Even though I'm confident his sons were never hit by a drunk driver, I really was sorry for what he was going through because something's happening in his life where he feels like he's neither able or willing to provide for himself through, through work. But the thing is, I have no idea how to help this guy because he just got up and left. We never formed a relationship. I don't know what his real situation is. I don't know how to help him. I don't really want to help him because I don't, I don't have a relation with him. I don't know this guy. It's hard to develop sympathy for someone who just tries to con you, you know? So what God really wants us to do is form relationships with those who come, come into our lives, and particularly people who have needs. He, God wants us to form relationships with each other so we begin to understand what our needs really are. And then we can develop a genuine concern for people's well-being. And we, we don't see people as an, as an object that just wants a handout. And they don't see us as just an object, as, a, as an ATM machine to get, get something from. We need each other, regardless of what our financial situation is or our or if we're working or not, or our age, or our education level, 
God calls us to be in relationship with each other and to understand our, our, our need for each other. I'm, uh, I'm reading this book right now. Probably some of you have heard of it. It was a quite popular book a while back called uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And it's really a well-written book. It's very thoughtful. And at the beginning of the book, it talks about how as children we're dependent upon our parents. And as we grow up, we come and be, become teenagers, we start to become independent. And we tend to think that independence is the goal. You know, we become independent, we can do things on our own, that's where we want to be. And as parents, sometimes we get frustrated with our teenagers who are independent because they kind of forget about us and we want to be needed, right? And, but as we grow and mature more, then hopefully we get to a third stage. And that third stage is interdependence. That's what God really wants for us, is to recognize our need for each other, to know that we're in relationship with one another. And regardless, if we're someone who has a financial shortcoming or if we're financially blessed or we have emotional needs or social needs or psychological needs or whatever they might be, we all have needs. We're all dependent upon God's grace, and we're all called to be in relationship with one another, uh, to bless one another and, and to encourage one another. And so... Um, when Paul tells us to, to have something to share with the needy, he, needs, he means more than just buying someone groceries or giving them a little money. He means that we're called to share our life together. And the result of sharing our life together is knowing how we may be called to help, help each other, and that includes material needs. And God doesn't necessarily want us just to give handouts to people because that can create dependency and that kind of thing, but sometimes it's if appropriate. But I look back at my experience with Danny, and when, the first time I gave him that 20 bucks, I didn't help him. All I did was encourage him to try to con someone else. All I did is kind of add to that sense of dependency. But if I was in a relationship with him, if I knew him in a situation, he knew me, he wouldn't want to use me, and I wouldn't want to so easily just dismiss him with, with, a, with a $20 bill. Um, but if we come to know each other, then... We have dignity because we treat each other as, as human beings. Now, we should be glad to help people when they need it. And those of us who need help shouldn't feel ashamed when we have to ask for it. That's what the body of Christ is for, to share the love of Jesus with each other. It, it does sad me and disappoint me a little bit, though, when people like Danny just come by the church for a little money and they leave and you never hear from them again. They, they don't want a relationship. Then it also saddens me a little bit when people in the church think that we can just hand someone a little money or a little groceries and let them be and forget about them because we're not treating them with dignity. We're not treating them with respect. We're not treating them as human beings. We're just treating them as an object to give them something and get, get, us, get them out of our hair. And so we're called not to be dependent of, upon other people or even independent from each other. We're called to be interdependent. We, we, we love and we need to be loved. We encourage, and we need to be encouraged. We help, and we need to be helped, uh, regardless of our financial status. Now, you might be thinking that Paul doesn't actually say anything about relationships in this verse. All, all he says is, have something to share with the needy. And that's true, but we need to read, the, read this in the larger context of what Ephesians is about. Remember, we had several sermons, like three in a row, that was about unity, right? And, and the, the, the letter is written to the church, to the saints, to the body of Christ. And so the whole context of this letter is about being in relationship with each other. And if you just go back a few verses, back to verses 11 and 12, I'll remind you of this text. It says, The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so as a pastor, my, part of my responsibility is to equip the saints, to equip all of us together for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. And one of the ways we do that is we recognize the needs that we have, whether relational or emotional or spiritual or material, and then God uses us to help meet each other's needs. And when that happens, people are drawn to the church because they experience the love of Christ. They experience the reality of Jesus. We're being the body, and the body then is built up. Now, I don't know if we're called as a church to participate with the Jobs for Life ministry. I think it's a really good ministry. I think they do some wonderful things. God is at work. It's a Christ-centered ministry. But looking at it, it's also a huge undertaking. I mean, they, we need lots of human resources. I don't know if we could really, at this point in our life of our church, if we could really sustain something like that. Maybe we could. We have to pray through that. It's also a, a large financial 
investment involved with a, a ministry like that. But I am convinced that the body of Christ is called to be in relationship with people in need. And together we meet each other's needs, we're interdependent of one another, and so in, in so doing we build up the body of Christ. We can do that through relationships with the four-day movement. We can do that just with, through other venues. We can do that just by being the church. But the important thing is that we help people get to the point where they can meet their own needs. And um, we don't just give a hand up. We don't give a hand, we give a people a hand up rather than a hand out. And in doing that, we show people that they're worthy of respect. It allows them the dignity of being self-sustaining and hopefully moves them towards a place in their life where they're soon also helping others. Now, I wanted to show you a picture of that, the woman um, in her mugshot picture. And I didn't have a copy of that. I also wanted to show you uh, a picture of what she looked like afterwards. So Nathan, can you bring up that photo? Hopefully. What do you think this woman's name is? What did you think her name was when I described the mugshot picture? You know, I, um, I was kind of wondering why they would ask. And you, can't, you don't know someone's name by looking, what they, looking at what they look like. You can't tell what a person's name is by that. But, you know, I think a lot about biblical names. And in the Bible, people tend to live up to the meaning of their name. Or God maybe ordains them to have a certain name because he knows what their life is gonna, how it's going to play out. And so thinking with, with that kind of mindset, I was thinking, I wonder if this woman's name is Hope. I wonder because in, through this ministry and through the work of God, she has hope, even at the lowest part of her life. And I thought that was a pretty good guess. I was wrong, but I thought it was a pretty good guess. And we learned that her name is actually Joy. And, and we learned that she went through this ministry. She got a wonderful job. Full disclosure, this is not actually her. I couldn't find her actual picture of her. But <laughs> this is someone I just got off the Internet. But she looks a lot like this. Her hair is well done. She has this beautiful, radiant smile. Her eyes sparkle. She's professionally dressed. She looks like her name is Joy. And she's living a good life. And she can provide for herself and her family. And she's able to pass that on now, helping others. She's, she's gone from taking to making to partaking in the lives of others. She's become interdependent in her community. And we praise God for that. And so we should all labor and work honestly so that we have something to share with the needy. But we're called to do more than just give people a few dollars. We're called to share our lives. And as we do this, God will use us to help others. And, and we learn to become a little bit more like our Savior. And then they'll experience the dignity of meeting their own needs and hopefully experiencing the joy of helping the next person as well, of becoming interdependent. And when we live in relationship with each other and, and meet each other's needs, we bring God glory. We reflect the image of the one who gave his only son for our forgiveness and salvation and who calls us to be in relationship with him and with each other. May it be so. Amen. And so our offering text today,